Sergeant and Mrs. Smith, you are going to love this house. Is that a tub in the kitchen? There's no field manual for finding the right home. But when you do, USAA Homeowners Insurance can help protect it the right way. Restrictions apply. Introducing our biggest GMC Acadia ever. Offering bigger screens, bigger views, and even bigger journeys. Live your biggest life in the all-new GMC Acadia. Hear that? Yeah, that's the sound of you relaxing, because now you're managing diabetes with the Freestyle Libre 3 system. You get to know your glucose levels and where it's headed. Manage your diabetes with more confidence with the Freestyle Libre 3 system. Ready to learn more about the number one prescribed CGM in the U.S.? Visit FreestyleLibre.us to learn more. Based on retail sales data for patients last filled prescription by manufacturer, refer to the Flair NL4 study published in BMJ Open Diabetes Research and Care 2019. Safety info found at FreestyleLibre.us. If you just read the bio for Dr. Steve, host of Weird Medicine on Sirius XM 103 and made popular by two really comedy shows, Opie and Anthony and Ron and Fez, you would have thought that this guy was, was a bit of a, you know, a, a clown. You never answered a single fucking medical question. Come on, man. I've got diphtheria crushing my esophagus. I've got Ebola virus dripping from my nose. I've got the leprosy of the heart valve exacerbating my incredible woes. I want to take my brain out and blast it with the wave, an ultrasonic, echographic, and a pulsating shave. I want a magic pill for all my ailments, the health equivalent to Citizen Kane. And if I don't get it now in the tablet, I think I'm doomed and I'll have to go insane. I want a requiem for my disease, so I'm paging Dr. Steve. Dr. Steve, no. It's Weird Medicine, the first and still only uncensored medical show in the history of broadcast radio, and now a podcast. I'm Dr. Steve with my little pal, Dr. Scott, the traditional Chinese medical practitioner who gives me street cred with the wacko alternative medicine assholes. This is a show for people who never listen to a medical show on the radio or the internet. If you've got a question you're embarrassed to take to your regular medical provider, if you can't find an answer anywhere else, give us a call at 347-766-4323. That's 347 poohhead Follow us on Twitter at Weird Medicine or at Dr. Scott WM and visit our website at drsteve.com for podcasts, medical news, and stuff you can buy. Most importantly, we are not your medical providers. Take everything you hear with a grain of salt. Don't act on anything you hear on the show without talking it over with your doctor, nurse practitioner, practical nurse, physician assistant, pharmacist, chiropractor, acupuncturist, yoga master, physical therapist, clinical laboratory scientist, registered dietitian, or whatever. Please don't forget stuff.drsteve.com, stuff.drsteve.com for all your online shopping needs. It really does keep us all afloat. And if you want some earbuds, check out tweakedaudio.com. Offer code FLUID will get you 33% off the best earbuds for the price and the best customer service anywhere on the Internet. And if you want to lose weight with me, let's do it together. Noom.drsteve.com. N O O M dot Dr. Steve dot com. It's not a diet, it's a psychology program. It will change your relationship with food. I had a rough day today with my food, and I'm going to have to talk to my uh, counselor about it. But that's what you have them for. You know, I don't know why I backslid today, but you know, tomorrow I'll get right back on it and get uh, be back where I was before. I love Noom, it changed my life. Noom dot Dr. Steve dot com. And, um, Check us out on uh, Cameo at cameo.com slash weirdmedicine. I'm cheap. And also, if you have back pain, check out backpain.drsteve.com. you got to spell it all out on that one. Or you can just go to uh, stuff.drsteve.com, and you can see the inversion table that I bought. And I'm telling you, it, that has changed my life. And I have a structural back problem, but talk to your the provider before you do anything like this but uh if if they think that an inversion table might help you uh, this one is fantastic and don't forget to check out dr scott's website at simplyherbals.net that's simplyherbals.net for all your herbals needs I yes guess. yes <laughs> still haven't wound it down yet well uh, not not down down but 
easing easing down okay easing down for sure yep so what's our next project going to be that we're going to lose money on oh gosh i don't know but if you give me just a little time i'll (laughs) think of something stupid well (laughs) i I don't think simply herbals was stupid i know people are getting sick of me starting the show with this every time it's just fascinating to me because it was such a good idea yeah it's been it's been it's been a lot of fun but it just was i'm ready to do something new yeah yeah all right i was waiting for some you know buy to buy it for a ton of money and then you that, and I could do our, that our, would be our traveling road show. What we need to do is open a damn marijuana dispensary, except it's not legal here. Yes, yes, so that yes. would probably get us in trouble. Yeah, you know, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, who gives a shit? Two old men end up in jail. Mm-hmm. Hey, um, so I am on Cameo now. Oh, cool. And we got a Cameo request. And um, I thought maybe we could just do it on the air because this person didn't actually ask me to say anything. Okay. And I thought we could do it from here and maybe there'd be something cool there. Uh, but you can go to cameo.com slash weird medicine. I'm cheap. <laughs> this is from Bill. It says my dad. Oh, it's for oh, it's for Bill. My dad, Bill, is turning the big six zero. Him and I are huge fans of weird medicine. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> Both podcasts and... Oh, you see, I can't shit on the guy. No. Well, I can in the cameo. No. Yeah. Dad and I, for 15 years, have season tickets to the Balt... Oh, the Baltimore Orioles. Yeah. Oh, cool. And on our drive back home, we always listen to Weird Medicine. So I cannot crap on old Jeff for his grammar on cameo, though. It doesn't really matter. It, it, if you ever watch any of these reality shows, they'll say, like, the person is trying to say... Uh, Madison's and my relationship, but they'll say Madison and I's relationship. Mm-hmm. That drives me absolutely insane. I'm screaming at the TV. I just want to talk about Caitlin and I's relationship. Ugh, so anyway, it is right. annoying. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Jeff can say him and I. It's fine. Okay, so you want to do this thing? Sure. All right, <clears throat> here we go. Uh, well, even, maybe I should put the music on, too. Oh, this is fascinating for the listeners, I'm sure. But show you the quality of the really awesome things that we do on uh, our cameo. Here we go. Two, three, two, one. Hello, Bill. Hello, Bill. I hear you're turning the big six zero. And your son, Jeff, uh, for the last 15 years, have had season tickets to the Baltimore Orioles. And on your drive back home, you've been listening to Weird Medicine. What's wrong with you people? You are weird. And uh, Dr. Scott wants to say hello. We are actually taping this show. Hey, guys. How's it going? Matter of fact, you can hear your cameo. This is the worst cameo I've ever done. And look at at the... um, the turkey neck. Oh, God. I have to hold my head up like this. You've got a triple chin. And then what's... Oh, what in the hell? With the teeth and the hair and... Yeah, I've got a... At least your nose hairs are... At least, at least his nose hairs aren't as long as usual. Yeah. Hey, know. and those those Orioles, they're going to have to pick it up this year. You think so? Dead last, brother. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna have to step it up. Well, how many touchdowns did they get? Exactly. All they're... right, listen. Happy birthday, Bill. I turned 60 and now I'm 65. It's not so bad. We're going <laughs> to die soon, but it, don't worry about it. It's okay. All right. Hey, See you guys. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right. Yeah, I Hello, guess. Bill. Oh. Hello. Uh-oh. Bill. I hear you're turning I'm just going to upload that. There you go. Okay. Perfect. So there you go. Yeah, that's give you an example of the scintillating content you'll get if you go to my cameo. But remember, it's cheap. It is cheap. <laughs> but, but captivating. <laughs> All right, what do you got? Anything? You got nothing? You want to just do a bunch of phone calls? Yeah, we do some phone calls. Okay, we're only six minutes in. It's probably good. We'll just do a crap load of phone calls. Cool. Okay. Number one thing, don't take advice from some asshole on the radio. Thank you, sir. That is, couldn't be more true. <laughs> All right. Um, let's try this one. Oh. Hey, Doc, this is Zach from Oki City. Um, hey, Zach. We would just like an answer uh, to something that's going on with my wife. Okay. Uh, she's had a terrible time with this. Uh, we don't have to be put on the air if, if you don't have the time, but if you could text us back a response, I'd appreciate well, it. Uh, my wife is having a it. very bad skin condition. Okay. Um, started out as thinking it might be psoriasis. She has a, a horrible rash and stuff on her legs the most, and her scalp is pretty bad. 
um, the rest of her body just has spotty red uh, spots. Like that yes, and um, like what? Wait, uh, what did she, she say? She went to a oh, doctor. No. They said, "Oh, that looks." She said something crucial there, and I couldn't hear what yeah. she said. It like I it sounded like she said like athlete's foot, but I'm not sure. Let's okay. go back and see because this is going to be an interesting. Uh, um, the rest of her body just has spotty red uh, spots. Like that yes, and like um, what? It wasn't athletes. One fault. more time, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, the rest of her body just has spotty red uh, spots. Like that, yes, and. Um, okay, I can't nah, get it. I can't yeah. get it. Not nothing. You know what? This isn't 1950. Yeah. The, the spouse can, the, the wife can speak for herself. Have you ever watched Mad Men? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so awful. Yeah. There's a scene where she, I think she's got <laughs> breast cancer. And it's January Jones, who, by the way, is hilarious on Last Man on Earth, but she plays a very serious role on that. Hmm. And uh, the doctor is just talking to her husband, doesn't even talk to her. Ugh. She's in, you know, over in the, and it just, that show is great for how, how much shit has changed oh, in, yeah. yes. you know, 50 years or what, 70 years now. Golly, you know, drinking at work, boning your secretary at work, getting them pregnant, and then, you know, just ignoring them, you know, just smoking. Oh, no, nonstop smoking. But then little things like that where the oncologist is just talking to the husband and, and she's just sitting in the corner looking at the wall. It's awful. It's as though she's it's not awful. even there. It's not even her disease. I know. Yep, it's terrible. I love January Jones, though. Yep. You know she, who she is? Yeah, yeah. She's, oh, God. Yeah, she's cute. Where do you know her from? Um, um, Mad Men. Oh, from Mad Men. Yeah, yeah, yeah Mad okay. Men, yeah. All right. Well, last man on earth, she was brilliant. But to me, she yeah. Besides Orville, uh, Orville Willis the fourth, uh, she was um, my favorite person on there. Hmm. Right. Uh, she's she went to a, a doctor. They said, "Oh, that looks like psoriasis." So she went to a dermatologist, and they took uh, uh, the skin samples, and they they were like, um, "Oh, that looks like psoriasis." We'll take skin samples. And they, the skin samples came back as eczema. Okay. They took two separate ones as eczema. So uh, she was trying to get into another dermatologist, and there was some mix-up, and she couldn't get, you know, the medicine she needed or whatever, and they sent her to this other doctor okay. who she's having to start all over again, and yep. they look at it, and, of course, they're like, oh, that's eczema. And she's like, no, I've taken two tests that says, uh, or they say it's psoriasis. And she says, no, I've taken two tests, and they said it's eczema. Okay. Can you please help me? And they're like, well, it looks like psoriasis. And I don't understand why these, I mean, the doctors aren't, <laughs> oh, God. they're not believing their own test. Right, right, right. So <laughs> well, because they didn't do it. Send pics of uh, the, the, her legs. The second one didn't do the test. Mm. So you tend to believe the test that you do. You do, right. Right. So. We can. I just need some advice on what you think might, what might be going on. You know, why would everyone say it's, psoriasis you know i mean it does i guess it looks like psoriasis it's not very rough though it's it looks like psoriasis to people who don't know what psoriasis looks like but it see it sounded like one of these people was a dermatologist but they're the ones that did yeah. the biopsy and said it was eczema right so you can get adult onset atopic dermatitis that's what adult onset eczema is i like the term atopic dermatitis better than eczema and um, the peak time for developing that is right around in your 50s. Now, he didn't say how old she is. <clears throat> now, some people have it as an adult, had it as a child. It can go away and then come back. And, um, you know, it's, it is different for adults. So this is sort of an allergic uh, dermatitis. And in adults, the skin is more dry and scaly which would make you look at it and say, oh, that might be psoriasis. You know, that's why they're saying that. Okay. And if you've had it for a long time, it can get really thick and leathery, and then that makes it even look more like psoriasis. Um, now, the adults tend to get it in different parts of their bodies. You get it at the backs of the knees, um, uh, crooks of the elbows, the back of the neck, and the face. Now, where did he say she? He, he said she had All it. of those places, yeah, yeah I think so, yeah, yeah. yeah, for the most part. And uh, <clears throat> adults can get it around their eyes, too. So, um, you know, getting the diagnosis is key. So what they're doing is right, is trying to get a diagnosis. But they've had two biopsies, said it was eczema. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much eczema. But there are different kinds of eczema. There's one called numular eczema. There's another one called neurodermatitis. And another one that's just plain old contact dermatitis. And the numular ex <clears throat> eczema, the reason they call it that 
is um, numula, I guess, is the word for coin in uh, in uh, Latin. You could be looking that up. Okay. Um, but they get these little coin, like round, itchy spots on the hands, forearms, and the lower legs, particularly. But let's see. Let's let him finish what he was saying. It's this bad red blotch. If it gets dry, uh, it does get a little flaky. But you put lotion on, it gets really smooth. It's just really red. That's not so. So um, mm. we would appreciate any response. Did you have anything to add, honey? I went to get some labs done, and the, the guy was going over the labs with me. He said that there wasn't anything that screened. But overall, it just looked like my system was just really overrun, basically, and said that my adrenals were really overworked. What? Um, but my inflammation panel comes back somewhat normal, which is so stupid because you would think my inflammation would be ridiculous. And then um, he looked at my face and he was like, well, I think you have cutaneous lupus. So I went to a rheuma, what? whatever they're called, rheumatologist or whatever. And they looked at it and I was like, well, that's psoriasis. That's not cutaneous lupus. So I just feel like I've been in this, this circle of doctors yeah. for about three years. Yeah, I don't blame her. Um, hmm. There are tests for lupus. You could do tests for that. There are blood tests for that. And they should do those because you don't want to miss that as a diagnosis. But um, for people who have eczema, look, it, um, let the rheum rheumatologist rule out uh, lupus. Now sure. that the specter has been raised, you need to rule it out. And uh, we're going to let those two biopsies stand. And then what the thing to do is treat this like it's eczema. Yep. And, and if, if it, it goes better, away, then that's what it by God is. And even if it's not, it goes away. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> even if it's psoriasis, <laughs> then it goes away. You're, that, you're that's still true. Good. Because the, the treatments are very sim sure. similar. But there is a new treatment for eczema. And it's called um, dupilumab or dupilumab. It's probably dupilumab. It is a monoclonal antibody that is... Um, uh, specific for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And if you have it and nothing else works, this stuff will kick its ass. Now, it is a monoclonal antibody, so there are some downsides to it, you know, as there are with all of these monoclonal antibodies, mm -hmm. just because you're you're introducing an immune molecule into your body that, you know, one that your body didn't produce. And, uh, you know, if it, it attacks something else, then it's, you know, it's a problem. But so you, this is a last resort. It's crazy expensive, but your insurance should pay for it mm -hmm. if uh, you've failed everything else. Yep. But I would let the rheumatologist uh, or your primary care can do a panel for lupus. Mm -hmm. It's easy. Hell, everybody knows how to do to yep. diagnose it. You don't diagnose it by looking at it. Yeah. And can I add, if if they want to, if they can, they, they can contact me through you. Yeah. Maybe I can turn them on to someone that practices authentic Chinese medicine in their area because there are some old Chinese herbs that actually do work for uh, these kind of conditions. So they yeah. work really well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, yeah. It's fine. I mean, Western medicine has obviously failed them. Yep, yep. yep. So what the hell? Yep. That's why we talked about that last week and other weeks that yeah. when Western medicine failed, I'd send them to Scott and yep. he'd always make them feel better. So I, I think that's fine. And we've got some and, good old herbs, I mean, that really do work. Yeah. Yeah, so, sure. Okay. Might, not, well, might not cure it, but at least make her feel a whole lot better. Yeah. Um, feel free to email us yeah. and let us know where this goes, because I'm going to be very interested in, in the next steps on this. Yes. And I'm sorry you got the runaround. And um, our, our most physicians' microscopic X-ray vision is really shitty. Mm-hmm. And so there are uh, there are some things that you can diagnose just by looking at them, mm -hmm. but even those. I'm thinking I'm I'm looking at you tinea versicolor even those we you know do the scraping and put it under the KOH just in case but potassium yeah. well to confirm the diagnosis sure, exactly the visual thing is kind of a screening test and then the follow up test is more specific and that's the way that you diagnose a lot of things mm -hmm. but you don't diagnose lupus by looking at it no no although <laughs> I did have uh, but you can be a you can patient, lean towards it I had this you? patient that had this weird dermatitis and um, I couldn't figure out what it was, and it turned out it was a thing called um, Porphyria cutanea tarda, right? So, and this was 35 years ago when I was in residency, and I I, I had messed with it, messed with it, couldn't figure it out, and then a the, um, gastroenterologist diagnosed it because it's a sign of liver disease, okay. often cirrhosis. 
Well, I had another person many years later come in with the same thing, and I said, we've got cutaneous, you know, porphyria cutanea tarda, and I sent him to a, a gastroenterologist who was a friend of mine. I said, you can't diagnose just by looking at it. <laughs> and I said, no, I can't. <laughs> he said, no, you cannot. <laughs> he sent him back to me, so I sent off some um, blood work. And, uh, it, you know, confirmed the diagnosis. And I <laughs> circled it and I went, consistent with, cutane, you know, um, porphyria cutanea tarda, big, big letters. I and underlined it. it multiple times and sent it back to him. He was impressed. I love it. No patient um, health identifying information in that story because uh, only the gastroenterologist saw that note. So but anyway, know. all right. Well, good luck, guys. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully she gets something soon. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, it doesn't look like we have a Stacy DeLoach call this time, but oh, man. we decided that Stacy needed a theme song. Mm-hmm. Now, if you all come up with a theme song for him and send it to us in a decent form, we might, might, this isn't a contest, but we might send you something. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Probably some Simply Herbals crap he's got in a corner, but we'll, we might yeah. send you something, but we'll certainly... Uh, talk about it a lot but uh, Dr. Scott did one <clears throat> and um, we were going to do one together and he was going to do one and I was going to do one and I really I only had like shit the bed well I, I waited until the last <laughs> minute I, I did my show prep for that like Dr. Scott does show prep for this show where he shows up and then opens up the computer and starts looking for I, things yes well, but, two uh, computers actually at the same time <laughs> it's true now so uh but he here's Dr. Scott's uh Stacy Deloach jingle see the Stacy Deloach is a good old guy See, see, now you're already lying, <laughs> and the intro is way too long for a jingle that we would play, you know, before one of his things. He's got a lot of thoughts that he pulls from the sky. He's a cop, he's a captain, he's an entrepreneur. His questions range from tough to profoundly demure. Now, what did that say? To profoundly demure. Tough to demure. Oh, Okay. Oh, yeah. But demure. Hey, you were supposed to. You when you're demurring. No, I, I can. This is my show. I can. I can shit on your song. That is um, true. And you can shit on mine too when I ever do one. Um, <laughs> but they, they, that's not what the. I think you're using that word wrong. You do when not, you demure, you, you're you're saying it means it's not. It, um, it's soft. It's gentle. It's not. It's. Um, Doesn't that mean? Okay. You don't. You don't believe this word is means what I think this word means. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> Echo, define demure. The adjective demure is usually defined as characterized by shyness and modesty, reserved. For more, yeah, ask that's what me I to thought. Like if somebody's demure, demure. Yeah, they're shy. Yeah. So does that fit with that? Yeah, okay. Oh, it does. Okay, okay, okay. Now you could have profoundly demure. I thought you were going to rhyme it with manure. That was what oh, I was yeah. looking for. Oh, yeah. Keep on cruising. This it's part. more like a love song to Yes, Stacey. yes. Now, this was a part you're supposed to help me with. This is a whistling part. You're oh. supposed to do Okay, I'll do it. There you go. Okay, there you go. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know that... You know they, they so have... we just did that as an example. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I did put one together. Uh, that I, I think that you'll find, um, you know, a, a very profound. Stacy Deloach has a pretty nice cock, and I think about it every day. Stacy Deloach has a mighty nice cock, and I'd like to ask it out to play. His glands are so luscious and huge, he had his hand of foreskin meat refined. Stacy Deloach has a pretty nice cock, and someday I'm gonna make it mine. Oh yeah, someday I'm gonna make it mine. <laughs> So that was the old uh, Sam Roberts song. Yes. Anyway. All right. I believe that second song had a little more, um, <laughs> what's a nice way to put this, um, computer, uh, um, kind of, um, 
uh, <laughs> refinement. <in mind. laughs> oh, you think it was more refined? <laughs> a little bit. So yes. anyway, uh, we need a, a ten second Stacy Deloach thing that says everything about a guy that calls into a radio show way too much, <laughs> but has really good questions. So we questions. can't. Yeah. It's not like snowy or creamy butters or one of those guys. I mean, Stacy's got good content. Not that uh, you know. Look, I don't even know snowy or creamy butter so i'm just saying all right very good yeah dr steve this is wade from louisiana so back in 1996 i was working in bosnia hmm. it was 12 hours a day seven days a week uh, i wore steel toed boots one of my toenails fell off yeah and it didn't fall off due to trauma it just came unstuck from the nail bed what, what do you the think hell is going on in the background? Sounds like a baby. And could I oh. force it to happen again? Say you have an ingrown toenail, could you do something to cause your toenail to no longer stick to the nail bed and pop off? A new gel- toenail grew back in its place. Yep. No problems. Yep. That looked deformed or anything. Just curious. Do you know the uh, the medical term for this? Hmm. No. Okay, it's onycholysis. Oh, I do know that. <laughs> I said that. So, um, onycholysis is a term for when your the nail bed and the nail separate from each other, mm-hmm. and uh, it can it once it separates, you can't get it to stick again, or it's very difficult. I actually got one to stick again after uh, traumatic onycholysis, but it was separated for such a short period of time. Mm-hmm. It was. Um, you know, somebody that had uh, hit, gotten their thumb with a circular saw Ooh, and split it, and then geez. the nail bed, yeah. you know, separated. But it, uh. it separated right down the middle, but then also separated from the nail, the nail separated from the nail bed. Mm-hmm. And uh, just for you medical students out there, the uh, thing to do in that situation, as long as they didn't hit the bone and there's not risk for osteomyelitis and it's a clean wound. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you know you stitch the meat together, then uh, take an eighteen gauge needle, which has a razor sharp edge on it, uh, on the bev- on the bevel, and you twist it at an angle on either side of the wound to the nail bed. Obviously, um, there's I skipped a step. Numb the <laughs> the the finger the digit up first, okay, and prep it and all that stuff. But you. Uh, Take this and use it as a drill to drill down at an angle so that you can take a large um, semicircular needle and pass it in the hole on one side of the wound Mm -hmm. through the nail bed and then out the hole on the other side. Mm -hmm. And then there are a couple of different knots that you can use that will pull that together under tension and won't break right and i can teach those to you too but um and when you do that uh you can pull the whole thing together and the nail bed will grow back together and the meat of the of the digit will grow back together and uh when that nail finally grows out it's about it takes about a year it'll be completely normal cool yeah it's pretty cool so anyway so yes so that's that's the only time I've been able to get an onycholytic nail to re-adhere. And the other thing that I did was I used a Lee press-on nail over it once I took the stitch out to keep that nail down and mm-hmm. keep it together. Okay, keep from curling? Uh, or Yeah, keep it from uh, from popping. Yep, sure. But anyway, um, uh, so uh, once the nail separates, it will s- stay separated. And then the new nail normally will grow in, though, and you'll have a totally normal nail, which is what he said happened. Very often this will happen with uh, tight shoes. So that could have been it. Yep. It, it actually, he, he said it wasn't any trauma. It wasn't any trauma he was aware of. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking, I wonder if he's military and was wearing some combat boots. And Well, that's what he said. He was wearing steel-toed boots. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And so you can get it from nail fungus and stuff like that, but it didn't sound like that's what it was. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can get it from nail polish. <laughs> which I didn't, I, you know, who knows? <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Wear it if you want. It's but, all good. Um, yeah, so it's very likely it was the steel-toed boots that did it, and he just had micro trauma over time, and it yep. just uh, caused his nail to fall off. It was too much. Too much, too much wear and tear on that yep. toenail. That's yeah. right. <laughs> too so much. Sounds good. All right, here we go. Today's episode is brought to you by Angie. 
Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your jobs and projects done well. Let me tell you, there's the version of it where you try to do something at home, and then there's a version of it where you have someone help you, you watch them do it the right way, and you go, thank God I didn't try to do that myself. I have fully done things around the home that I think look good, and then a bang in the night, and I wake up to a shelf collapsing, a painting falling off the wall. Like it, I've, I've seen it all go south. I own a home, and I can tell you... I know how much work it can take, whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality. It can be hard just to know where to start. But now all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. Whatever your home project, big or small, indoor or outdoor, you can Angie that and connect with skilled professionals to get the project done well. Right now, one of my wish lists is I want a bike for my condo in Milwaukee and I would love to rig it up on a pulley in the ceiling because I have one of those like lofted ceilings, but I'm so scared to try that on my own. Angie has 20 years of home experience and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish or help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly, which means you can take care of any home project in just a few taps. Because when it comes to getting the most out of your home, you can do this when you Angie that. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. Hey, Dr. Steve, uh, this is Cameron, and I left you an email, and I'm going to ask the question. Uh, my wife and I are considering taking the, the Pfizer shot today. But Good. I have many, many people who are super anti-vaxxers talking primarily around, you know, this R- um, or DNA or RNA, whatever they call it, saying um, there's these proteins that are stimulated by 5G that if provoked can cause many different illnesses like heart disease, diabetes, can cause people to drop dead. Basically, um, I was told not to take this shot because if I take it's kind of the killer shot. The killer uh, shot? There's all these conspiracy Ooh. things out there. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. The killer shot. Never heard of that. So we have, how many people have been vaccinated now? Can you look that up? It was 800 million. 800 million. That, was, that was three weeks ago. Was I weeks will ago. look. Yeah, I will yeah. certainly look. So um, look, I have, if someone comes to me and says, I am concerned about antibody induced immune enhancement with this vaccine, I'm all with you. I understand your concern. And I'll talk about what that is in a second. But um, show me where this is a killer shot. We've vaccinated a billion people. <clears throat> and what we've seen is a decline in, in deaths, over, you know, significantly overall. I mean, our oh system, gosh, yes. it's, you know, it's we're down to 50 patients, I think. Right. You know, and uh, so we're seeing a decline in people being admitted who are in risk groups. 65 and older, we're seeing a decline in people going to the hospital. We're seeing a decline in people dying. So uh, now, is every vaccine, let me put it this way, is any vaccine perfectly safe? No. No. But, you know, you wear your seatbelt um, to prevent the occasion of you being thrown from your car during a wreck. And it, there's no question that seat belts prevent death. But there is a one in a million chance that if you're wearing your seat belt, that will trap you in your car and you can't get out and that will cause you to die. So would I then say, well, because of the one in a million chance, I'm never going to wear my seat belt? No, I, I can't. <laughs> it doesn't, I you can't work it out that way. The benefit is far outweighed by the risk. Mm hmm. And that's the case with this vaccine. Yeah, go ahead. It's in, in the world, there's approximately 2 billion people that have had Now it's 2 billion. 2 billion, yeah, in the world. That's a significant fraction it's, of the world's population. Well, we got 7 billion now. That's yeah, incredible. What's the world population? Now? I don't know, but I can, I can look it up. Echo, what's the world co population now? Here's something I found on the web. <laughs> According to slideshare.net, more than 3 billion people are expected to watch the World Cup in what? Brazil. Echo, stop. Well, there you go. Echo, what is the population of Earth? Echo, what is, what is the population of Earth? You asshole. <laughs> According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 
The world population today is approximately 7.77 billion. Almost eight. Okay, echo. Thank you. Hmm. So almost eight billion people. So we've vaccinated 25 percent of the world. Which is incredible. It is incredible. You know. Now, I, okay. So let's talk. Go ahead. What no, were you no, going to say? You, you, say? Uh, no, I'm like, uh, if if if, the, if there's a medical reason to not get your shots or, or something that's, that's legitimate, I understand it. But but just don't go around telling people a bunch of crazy shit. Well, I get told I'm a shill for the vaccine company, but uh, who is the one person that's railing against the varicella vaccine? Mm-hmm. I mean, I see people railing against all these vaccines that actually do something. Yep. I don't ever see anybody railing against the varicella vaccine except for me. Mm-hmm. And I'm not even railing against it. I just have concerns. It's because it's not, it's, it's not as much fun. It's not sexy. It's not as much fun. It's not sexy. That's right. But, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, well, let's hear what else he has to say and see if we can answer something specific. Okay. This bit, I pretty much see the people who are anti-vaxxers. There's a reason why they're anti-vaxxers, but that's another side story. But. Really, just want to make sure that this thing is safe. I just keep hearing all this conflicting information. Yeah. Um, well, you got to define safe. Around, uh, do you by safe? Do you mean a hundred percent safe and no uh, adverse events? Then no, no. If that's your definition of safe, then it's not safe. No. But show me something that is. It is that. anything. Is drinking water a hundred percent safe? No. No. Is going in the sunshine a hundred percent safe? Yeah. Nothing is a hundred percent safe. Yeah. Zero. <clears throat> and, and so you have to. How unsafe is it? So mm-hmm. what's your risk? What's yeah. the risk of having something bad happen to you? So. You could say, well, if you're a woman aged 18 to 49 and you're going to do the um, viral vector vaccine, which was Mm J&J or AstraZeneca, uh, your risk appeared to be about one in a million uh, over three months to uh, have uh, a thrombosis in your brain. And one of those people that that happened to that I'm aware of died, and it may have been more than that, but it was about one in a million. Of course, you and I calculated the risk of that happening in the general population, and over a three-month period, it worked out to about one in a million about because it was, yep. it was four in a million over, um, over a year. Yep. Yep. So that may have not even have been a thing. Mm-hmm. So... And the, yes, and then there are people that, oh, well, he took the vaccine the next day, he dropped dead. Well, it might have been a myocardial infarction. Could have been vaccine related. Sure. Probably not. If you have somebody that's going to die on Wednesday and they get the vaccine on Tuesday, mm-hmm. that's going to be hard to convince anybody that the vaccine didn't kill them. That's correct. Yeah. Can't argue that. Well, you can argue it, but no. it's it would be difficult. It's, it's hard to accept. Right. When... You know, it's your loved one that it happened yes. to, and you want to. You always want to have a reason for things because we don't like things that just happen for no reason. Mm-hmm. Agreed. That bugs us. Yep. Agreed. You know, we can't control that. But anyway, okay, let's see what else he said. Being evoked by some radio frequency waves, kind of like a quote a machine. What? Causing lots of problems. So, if you have any science or anything to give us, yeah, I got all kinds of science on that one. That's horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, let's just talk a little bit about, uh, and just me saying it, in, that doesn't prove anything. But um, we do not have the technology to take messenger RNA, which is just, uh, you know, a sugar and some other little, you know. Um, these other little molecules that that are just clumped together Mm -hmm. in a string. And we don't have the technology to then make that somehow a radio frequency initiated machine that's going to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't make transistors out of mRNA. And you got to have transistors to make a freaking radio or a tube or something if you're going to have it broadcast something. Now, receiver, you only need a diode. So you may have made a crystal radio set in back in the day. And a crystal radio set used a little square of, uh, if, was it gallium? No, it wasn't gallium. Oh, crap, what was it? Look up crystal radio, will you, and see what the metal was. Um, and, uh, and you had a little whisker that you would put on it, and that created a diode it's so that um, uh, uh, energy could only go in one direction. And when you do that, you can actually you can actually decode radio signals because they were amplitude modulated, and they would go up and down, up and down, and they could only go in one direction, 
once they hit this thing. So you would only get the up part and the up part had different amplitude and that you could turn that into audio. Terrible uh, explanation of it, but that's how that worked. But we don't have anything like that for transmitting and that would be the only, there's no point in just having a receiver. You would want have to have a transmitter if you're gonna track somebody or you're gonna activate this thing with radio waves. So let's um, talk just a little bit about what genes are and how they function and how mRNA works into this. So the genes in your DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, encode for protein molecules. That's all they do. That's all DNA does. So to make an eyeball, you have to make proteins that cons- that that uh, comprise the eyeball, but you also have to make other proteins that construct the eyeball. And then you have to make proteins that can separate fluid from blood so that you can fill the eyeball with fluid and all this stuff. You know, it's, it's crazy, but it's all done in protein. And that's all DNA can encode for. So um, when you have this di- um, deoxyribonucleic acid, it's sitting there encoding for all these proteins. Now, uh, when you want to make one of those proteins, you have to unravel the DNA. And when you do that, there is this stuff called RNA polymerase, which then will read the DNA and make a strand of messenger RNA out of it. And what that messenger RNA is going to do is take this signal, uh, you know, the encoded gene in the DNA, and take it out into the cell to and say, this is the order from the boss. Mm -hmm. And this is how you make the protein. And each three, um, uh, you know, each group of three sugars Mm -hmm. will code for a different amino acid. Okay. All right. So you've got four of them, and so you can combine them. Uh, you know, U U U U C U U A U U G U like that. Okay, and so there's a whole bunch of uh, combinations that you can make using four nucleotides. Mm. Now, uh, and there's a bunch of amino acids. So each one of these groups of three will code for a different amino acid. Now the amp- messenger RNA takes this signal. Or these this information, these in, set of instructions from the DNA, and takes it out into the cells where they will then be processed by another type of RNA called ribosome. It's big protein machines. Mm. These are machines. Yep. The body knows how to make machines. We don't. Yeah. And these machines will uh, allow the mRNA to enter in one end, and then it will start to process it and move it forward, and it will read three three nucleotides and then attach the appropriate amino acid mm-hmm. it's all chemistry mm-hmm. there's no thinking there's mm-hmm. it, it's all just chemistry when you're presenting these things then it configures the ribosome a different way so that that amino acid that's the correct one will will attach right and uh it will keep doing that until the f- whole mrna strand is red and then when the whole mRNA strand is red, then you have the protein that it was encoded for floating around in the cell, and then it has to go do what it's supposed to do. Mm-hmm. It's the most amazing yeah, thing. incredible. That this was going on for hundreds of millions of years before humans ever had a clue of, about <laughs> what a nucleotide was or what chemistry was. Right. You know? Yeah. It's just like, but it was still, it was going on. It was happening. Yeah. It was happening in dinosaur cells. Mm. When... Uh, you know, and we we talk about numbers too. Um, dinosaurs couldn't count, as far as we know. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I've heard it said that if two dinosaurs went to a drinking hole, there were still two of them there, even if they were too dumb to know that the you know that was a number two, right? <laughs> there were still two, still two dinosaurs, and mRNA and DNA and all these things were happening, and they were doing this incredible work, right? way before we became aware of any of it. Well, anyway, now, what happens to the mRNA after it passes through the ribosome and makes this polypeptide or protein? It breaks up into its constituent parts so that it can then be uh, reassigned to make another uh, protein uh, through that RNA polymerase enzyme. Okay. 
Okay, so that's the one that reads the DNA and makes the mRNA. Well, now what we're doing is we are making mRNA in the laboratory and injecting it into people in these little lipid uh, globules. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps it stable. And some of them work their way into the cell. Some of them just break up and then get you know used by another cell for something, some other purpose. But uh, the ones that make it into the cell, some of those will get read by a ribosome. And then the ribosome will create the protein that that mRNA strand that we just created in the lab instructed them to do. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's it's not too dissimilar from in driving instructions. Turn right, then turn left, then go one mile and turn right. It's kind of the same thing. It's a linear set of instructions on how to make a protein. Yep. And once you make that spike protein, that mRNA vaccine, uh, you know, it will, it might hang around. Maybe it gets red one more time, and then it just breaks up, and then the body uses the nucleotides that are there uh, to make other mRNA strands to do other things. Mm. And that's it. It's incredible. And and that's literally it. It's cool. Yeah, it's super cool. And I've said on this show multiple times because this sh- shit keeps <laughs> being brought up. Go watch a video on mRNA transcription, and if you can find one with a good, like, 3D Mm. animated model, it will blow your mind that this is going on in your cells. On trillions, how many cells are in the human body? And I'm I'm not sure the answer to that. I don't know. Echo, how many cells are in the human body? The typical adult human has 37.2 trillion cells. That's what I thought. It's, It's in the trillions. So this is going on 32 trillion times in your, you know, at multiple, well, shit, it's happening multiple times in your cells all the time. The the cell isn't just making one protein. Mm -hmm. It's making all kinds of stuff, you know, maintenance proteins, proteins that go on the cell surface that we don't even know what the hell they are. Um, Things like um, uh, proton pumps in the stomach. Mm -hmm. Those are made through this process. Mm -hmm. Proton pumps are cool. They take a quantum object, which is a naked proton, which is a collection of three quarks, and somehow the human body knows how to manipulate this quantum object and pump it into your stomach to make acid to kill bacteria yep. and digest food. Yeah. Now, how it's insane. mind-blowing is that? Yeah. It is insane. Mm. But it's a killer vaccine, though. Yeah, it's killer. So I, I it's communicating with satellites. Yeah, and it's coming. All right, I'm, come on. Makes no sense. Come but. on. I wish that we could make stuff that we could inject into people that you could communicate with satellites. Because I'm I'm a ham radio operator. That would be awesome. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> so all right, I don't know if that's going to convince anybody that doesn't believe me. But okay, just for my street cred, I'm not a. Uh, you know, uh, just a blind vaccine supporter. I am not a fan of the varicella vaccine. I'll mm-hmm. tell you what. I, I am, well, sorry, I am a fan of the varicella zoster vaccine, which is the shingles vaccine. Right. What I'm talking about is the chicken pox vaccine. Okay. And my issue with that is we don't have long-term data to know that these people that got the chicken pox vaccine are going to need boosters down the road. Mm-hmm. And chicken pox is not like measles. Measles kills one in a thousand kids. I had a friend in high school, I'm sorry, in elementary school that died from measles before the measles vaccine right. you know, was a common thing. And uh, but chickenpox can kill, but it's much. Uh, you know, the risk is much less. Mm. People just get chickenpox parties, get all the kids infected. And uh, but the problem is when you're an adult and you get chickenpox, it's a problem. Yeah, your body can't handle it. Just like COVID. Right. You're a kid, you get it. Yeah, you're fine. You're an adult to get it. There might be a problem with chickenpox. There will be problems mm-hmm. if you get it as an adult. And uh, the the adult human body doesn't like it, and it causes a lot of inflammation, and those people are really, really sick. And a pregnant person who gets chicken pox, that baby is in big trouble. Yep. So um, I, I don't see the benefit of a varicella vaccine that might need a booster. You might have some adults running around right now that are susceptible mm-hmm. to uh, chicken pox. Uh, that that don't know it and could have some problems down the road, yeah. and uh, that's my issue with it. So I don't I don't see the value in it, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. So there you go. There you go. 
Good stuff. Um, now, if you want to vaccinate everybody mm-hmm. and just to get rid of chicken pox altogether, I'm all I'm for that. But that's right. not what they're doing. No. If you want to eradicate varicella so that there will never be a chicken pox case ever again, no even rare deaths from chicken pox and no shingles in your eye. Ugh. Cause if or you, anywhere else. If you're listening to this and you're not aware, shingles is chicken pox virus come back to roost one more time. Yep. And it can go anywhere. Yeah. Because we've it can seen go it anywhere there. that it's been stored. We've seen so. it anywhere. Uh, but, and, yes, you can get in your eye and it sucks. Ugh. So uh, if, if that's what the game is, I'm okay with it then. Yep. But if that's not what the game is, just to prevent kids from getting chicken pox, I don't see the value. So, anyway. All right. Uh... Hey, Dr. Steve. Hey, man. Um, just want to ask you your opinion, and uh, I guess feel free to ignore this considering how hot button it seems to be becoming. Now, those um, are the fun ones. Ivermectin. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. There seems to be quite a bit of uh, censorship of people that aren't like your regular crazy conspiracy theory type people and, you know, seem to have PhDs yeah. And, uh, yeah. and are very well versed in such things. Um, saying that uh, ivermectin, when used prophylactically or in conjunction with um, with other drugs, uh, can be very effective uh, against uh, COVID nineteen. Yeah. So anyway, I'm just curious what your opinion is of that. Um, okay. I think it- yeah. Um, so here's the thing. Ivermectin is an interesting molecule, and it needs to be studied. And, in fact, it is. I just, while he was talking, I went to clinicaltrials.gov. I recommend that all of you do it. And uh, I put in COVID-19 and ivermectin, and there are 70 studies, 70. So it's not like people are blowing this off. Sure. What they want is double-blind, placebo-controlled data that says it's safe and effective. That's all we need. Right we don't want to to treat people with stuff just because we think it's going to work. So now, uh, here's ivermectin nasal spray for COVID-19 patients. I think that's a cool one. Here's clinical trial of ivermectin plus doxycycline for the treatment of confirmed COVID-19 infection, and it has results. So let's just click on it. This Carl will love me for uh, doing um, um, research on the air. Oh, and they just give you raw data. Okay, yikes. Okay, um, let me see. So overall number of participants analyzed were 183 uh, with ivermectin and 180 with placebo. So that's pretty good. And uh, it looks like uh, count of participants, unit of measure of participants. I can't find the, the results. So, But there are results out there. And if they are satisfactory and show a statistically significant improvement at where the risk is uh, outweighed by the benefit, hell yeah, we'll use it. Sure. And I can't, they, they just published raw data on this, so I can't I can't pull the, the answers on this particular one. But there's a bunch of them. Here's uh, uh, another completed one, ivermectin for severe COVID-19 management. That one has results. Um, here's usefulness of topical ivermectin and carrageenan to prevent contagion of COVID-19. It has results. There's a bunch of them that are recruiting. Some are not yet recruiting. So they're looking at it. Okay. And uh, if if we get a, a preponderance of evidence that it's the real deal, um, we'll be using it. But that's what we need. That's cool. what we got to have. Sounds good. Now, here's one that was withdrawn, outpatient use of ivermectin. I wonder why it was withdrawn. This was done at Temple University. Some of these got withdrawn because of political pressure, I think, too. You know, people are like, why are you doing, you know. So uh, let me see. Um, hmm. I'm not saying this one was. I want to see if they say why it was withdrawn, but it doesn't say. At least not that I can just yank it up real quick. But anyway, yes, I think all of these things should be studied and we should do the science the proper way. And when we get the preponderance of evidence, we should use it if it's, uh, good. If it's good. All right. This will be spam. Let's see. Hello. Yep. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Hello. Sometimes you got to say it loud enough so they can hear you. No. Okay. All right. Yeah, so I just alerted somebody that's a live number. <laughs> I was uh, hoping that it was a good spam call and we could have a little fun, but there you go. Hmm. All right. Kit Boga, I am not. Hey, 
Hey, Dr. Steve, how you been? Good, man. How are you? Good, good. Question for you. How bad is smoking two cigars a week? Two a week. I don't inhale. It's relaxing. I'm not a drinker. Well, what's the real deal? Yeah. Thanks. Love the show. Hey, thanks, man. Well, uh, the FDA um, has always said that cigar smoking carries a lot of the same health risks as cigarette smoking, but they're, uh, you know, cancer of the mouth, lung cancer, heart disease, that cigars aren't a safe alternative to cigarettes and sh certainly should not be inhaling them. But um, there was a systematic review that was published in uh, BMC Public Health looking at the risks of cigar smoking. And um, they looked at 22 different studies, and what they found was um, that there was very low risk for people that used one to two cigars a day. Now, I'm not encouraging cigar smoking, and you need to look at evaluate the risk yourself, but uh, we always said back in the day that if you smoke one or two cigarettes even a week, mm -hmm. we don't have any data on that, that you know we figure it can't be good for you, but uh, the risk may be manageable. So you just got to decide whether you're going to uh, manage that risk or not. So relative risks for mortality among men smoking one to two cigars per day was at uh, 1.02. So it's, you know, it's basically unity, meaning that there wasn't any change. Right on. Plus, so. it's probably good for his mental health. <laughs> yeah, maybe. You know, I mean, I'm not listening. No, I'm not. I know. I'm not. Don't saying smoke. Smoking. No, I'm not saying smoking's good. But you asked a question about yeah. what the data shows, and the data looks okay. Yeah. And uh, if we uh, want to explore that further, we could in the future uh, get dive deeper into that. All right, Doctor Scott, let's do one more. I think we got. Time hey, Doctor Steve, this is Kate in Virginia. I really appreciate your show. Hey, thanks, um, I'm Kate. fairly new to it, but I have really enjoyed it. Got a couple of questions for you and Dr. Scott. Okay. If you answer, please answer this on the podcast. We'll do. Um, we'll do both. My husband was diagnosed with a condition called chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy, yep. or CIDP, on April 10th, 2018, at the age of 72. Okay. He is in chronic pain from this condition, even though his doc says um, he shouldn't be experiencing this much pain. Um, well, he has episodes of telling someone they shouldn't be experiencing something is a terrible that? idea. <laughs> I well, I mean, it's just they are experiencing it. It doesn't and help it's their they, own pain. It's, it's not somebody's pain to tell them. It doesn't help that they shouldn't be. No. So, but anyway, keep pain as well. Um, he is currently allotted a whopping 38 Percocet tablets per month. Ooh. And this is at a uh, 5 to 325 dosage. Okay. That works very well for him when he takes it, but his docs are reluctant to um, prescribe it or, yeah. or to prescribe any more than 38 tablets. Yeah. Um, and it's not that he wants more Percocet. He just would like some pain relief. He's right. getting really tired of being in pain. Understood. They have tried him on various off-label medications oh, that boy. have not relieved his pain at all. Okay. Well, yeah, this is a tough one. So um, CIDP is um, something that's it's related to Guillain-Barre syndrome. Chronic, meaning it's not acute. Inflammatory, meaning it's autoimmune. Demyelinating, meaning that it takes the sheath from uh, the nerve cells that have insulators, mm -hmm. insulation, which is called myelin, and it just eats it away. So now you're getting short circuits and stuff, and, right. and it slows down transmission as well. Right. Polyneuropathy, meaning poly meaning many, neuropathy meaning many nerves and nerve, you know, disease of the nerves. So it's a long autoimmune insulin, or insulin, insulation destroying disease of multiple nerves. Right. Chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. There you go. So anyway, it is related, as I said, to Guillain-Barre syndrome, which we know about with vaccines and stuff and influenza, where people will get this uh, demyelinating uh, neuropathy of the legs and it makes them weak. And if it 
continues to march up from the legs up to the lung lung area, the lungal area. Lungal. Um, then you know you stop breathing, so it's a it's a rough one. Um, there's a bunch of uh, different ones, uh, different varieties of this. Too many for me to even start to list. So, uh, and I, I don't think that pain is unreasonable to expect in a situation like this. And there's sure. some sub versions of this. There's not just one disease that's CIDP. Mm-hmm. There's multiple many. variants of it. And his, he has pain. A lot of patients have weakness, messed up reflexes. There can be atrophy of the muscles because they, when they get denervated, uh, you disconnect the nerves to them. They just yep. they start to just wither away. Uh, fasciculations, loss of sensation. You can also get pain as well. The fact that uh, oxycodone at low dose works for him tells me that you know he's not a drug. Se- well, you know he doesn't seem to be a drug seeker. Right. It's very low dose and it works. Yeah. They're just giving him thirty eight a month. How are you supposed to divide that up into thirty days? No. So some days you can take two, I guess, and other days you just take one. Mm. Um, and but the problem with oxycodone is it's basically a four hour drug. Right. So he's getting relief for four hours. Short acting. So I would do a couple of things. Uh, first off, make sure they're treating this properly. Most of the time, we will treat this with um, uh, medication that uh, treats inflammation. So intravenous immunoglobulin. Other treatments like corticosteroids, stuff like that. You know, if you can reverse the process, sure. you can make the pain better. And then if, uh, you know, you're doing all those treatments or you're waiting for those treatments to kick in and it's time to uh, do, uh, you know, pain management, see a, a pain management person. Shoot and you. see somebody like Dr. Scott and attack this from multiple angles. Because if you just go barreling in like the Romans lined up in a line, sticking at people with spears, and then the vandals come and go, well, hell, look at, we could just go behind them and kill them. Mm-hmm. You know, they they were destroyed because of a, um, a single brute force approach to warfare, whereas you, it, it, when we're fighting a, a battle against pain, you want to have a multifaceted approach. You want mm-hmm. to flank your enemy. So see Dr. Scott and do some acupuncture and do some deep relaxation. Um, uh, you know, massage therapy, any of those kinds of things that might help mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Uh, relaxation therapy, yeah. the trip app, get an Oculus go and slap the trip app on him and uh, get him some deep relaxation that way. Uh, stress reduction, all those things will help. Yep. And then yeah, see pain management and yes. get them to give you a few more Percocet every day. Yeah. That's just wacky to it's me. It's crazy because we don't know the whole This guy's 70 about, years yeah. old yeah. and he's got demyelinating yeah. polyneuropathy. That's how he's going to have to spend the rest of his days and they're giving him 30 <laughs> Percocet yeah. a day. I'm only laughing because you, you have to laugh to keep from crying. Oh, that's terrible. You know, it's a terrible disease. But, you know, I would throw in there too, Dr. Steve, make sure there's not some kind of some kind of thing that's making his neuropathy worse. You know, and sometimes it's yeah. their medications and oh, true things that just true, to rule true, true. out, just to rule out. We don't know his whole case or anything, but yep. there are medications that can cause these these demyelinating polyneuropathies. That, that if he's taking these things, stopping that insult, like you said, and then taking the proper medications, yeah, he might feel um, better. I'm not aware of medications that cause this particular neuropathy, Mm -hmm. but I wouldn't be surprised. You can see it with diabetes mellitus and HIV, Mm -hmm. particularly paraproteinemia, stuff like that. Um, So, but yeah, I I would look at all of those things Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. You just never know. No. All right. But uh, yeah, I would pursue the pain management thing a little bit further. It doesn't sound like... He's at high risk for pathologic use of his no. opioids, and he's getting some release, relief from them. Now, you get a 70-year-old male or a 70-year-old female, same, um, a non anti-inflammatory drug may be higher risk for them than a low-dose opioid. Yes. Because of bleeding. Stomach and- bleeding, heart disease, et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah, There's that's right, because of some of those, uh, particularly the COX-2 inhibitor yeah. type uh, uh, anti-inflammatory medications increase your risk of heart attack and yes, stroke. Yeah, yeah, yes, it is. 
So, uh, and then Tylenol, if you take enough of it, you know, the older you are, mm. the less of that you can tolerate. It can mess your liver up. Yep. Three, about 3,000 milligrams or three grams a day. And even that, if you're a frail elderly person, I'd be nervous about taking even that much. Oh, yeah. Sure. Me too. There's a lot of other options, I would say. Yeah. So, you know, yep. that's six of those 500s mm. a that's day. a bunch. Yep. So uh, in in those cases, often the opioid by itself is a better choice. And in his case, what's the Tylenol doing for him? Mm-hmm. The acetaminophen. Just mm-hmm. give him the, uh, you know, plain oxycodone. Maybe a long-acting pain medication. Or down the road when down he road, is. Yeah. Look, if, if they started him on a long-acting pain medication right now, we'll snow him. Mm-hmm. Because the lowest dose of the long-acting pain medications is way more than what he's taking right, right. now. Right, right. You know? So, but down the road, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. I mean, that's proper pain management is when yeah. he gets to a certain level, he needs to long-acting pain medication. What about, Dr. Steve, what about a patch that would, that would slow, slowly? You're you talking know. about like a, a transdermal fentanyl yeah. patch? Yes. Okay, again, not for the opioid-naive elderly. Yeah, yeah. He is opioid-naive because he's taken five milligrams Lotus, of yeah. oxycodone a day. He needs to be up to 60 milligrams before you even start thinking. Okay. Of, and that's 60 milligrams of morphine equivalents, which would be, and now we're getting deep into the weeds, 40 milligrams of oxycodone. So right you need to be taking eight of those a day before they even start thinking and about he's a not patch. even close. So help, you'll, help see elderly, <laughs> yeah, you'll see elderly, um, uh, elderly opioid-naive folk end up, uh, on the ventilator for a day or two or getting Narcan because a very well-meaning person slapped a duragesic, duragesic patch on them. Right on. And, uh, but it wasn't appropriate. Right on. You know, but anyway. Well, there you go. Yeah, so just so we get that clear. Yeah. Dur- uh, transdermal fentanyl patch is indicated for people who need round-the-clock dosing mm. by and for folks whom other modalities haven't been effective and people who are opioid tolerant. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Scott, oh, yeah. for bringing that up. It's very clear it up. Um, all right. Well, listen, we certainly cannot forget to say thanks to Dr. Scott and check out simplyherbals.net as long as it's there. Please go there and get something from him What's left? so that I don't have to pay him when he shuts it down. <laughs> Let's keep it going. Thanks to everyone at SiriusXM whose steadfast support of this show has sustained us over the years, particularly Lewis Johnson. Jim McClure, Sam Roberts, James Norton, Travis Tepp, Troy Hinson, Paul Opcharski, and Roland Campos. And what in the hell sign-off is this? Where's the um, the uh, skank and the Saratoga skank and all of that stuff? What mm-hmm. in the hell have I done? Well, all right. I guess they don't get a shout-out today. We'll get them next time. Yeah, I guess. What in the hell? Oh, no, there it is. Well, that's weird. Um... Yeah, we can't forget Rob Sprantz, Bob Kelly, Greg Hughes, Anthony Cumia, Jim Norton, Travis Teft, that ghoul girl, Lewis Johnson, Paul Ofcharski, Steve Tucci, Chowdy1008, Eric Nagel, the Port Charlotte Horror, the Saratoga Skank, Roland Campo, sister of Chris, Sam Roberts, she who owns Pigs and Snakes, Pat Duffy, Dennis Falcone, Matt Kleinschmidt, Dale Dudley, Holly from the Gulf, Steve Tucci, again, the great Rob Bartlett, Vicks Nether Fluids, Carl's Deviated Septum, Bernie and Sid, Martha from Arkansas's daughter, Ron Bennington, and Fez Watley, whose support of this show has never gone unappreciated. Listen to our Sirius XM show on the Faction Talk channel, Sirius XM channel 103, Saturdays at 7 p.m. Eastern, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, on demand, other times at Jim McClure's pleasure. Many thanks to our listeners whose voicemail and topic ideas make this job very easy. Go to our website at drsteve.com for schedules and podcasts and other crap. Until next time, check your stupid nuts for lumps, quit smoking, get off your asses, get some exercise. We'll see you in one week for the next edition of Weird Medicine.